Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, one lawmaker advocates for legalizing aerial and audible fireworks in Minnesota, and another proposes a constitutional amendment that would dedicate funds for long-term care for the elderly and disabled. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capital Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. As the legislature wraps up its work this session, we're looking forward to summer in Minnesota, days at the lake, the state fair, and fireworks. Senator Jason Rarick introduced a bill this session that would expand the kinds of fireworks that can be used in Minnesota, and he now joins me in the studio. Welcome. Thank you for having me. What types of fireworks are currently allowed in Minnesota, and what would you like to see allowed in Minnesota? Uh, so currently what you can use is what they uh, define as spark emitting and ground based. So every, any, anything that sits on the ground and just shoots sparks say 15 to 20 feet into the air or sparklers. Um, what I would like to expand to would be what is defined as aerial and audible. So uh, things that will shoot into the air, whether that's bottle rockets, uh, Roman candles, or the larger uh, mortars. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and that's, uh, I think we see a lot of those being used around the state, and I think, you know, we should be bringing in that revenue. That's well, and you said audibles too, like, mm -hmm. give, can you give an so example? Firecrackers so firecrackers would be, yeah, so most okay. of the spark emitting don't make much noise. Right. Um, these would have the boom that goes with. Right, right. So I've lived in states most of my life that only allow the fireworks that Minnesota allows, and yet I've known so many people who as the fourth approaches, they take their road trips to the states that have more forgiving fireworks laws and they stock up and they bring them back and they use them anyway. Is this bill for those kind of hardcore fireworks lovers? Uh, you know, it's a combination. Um, that's part of it. And we are completely surrounded now um, by states that sell the aerial and audible. Iowa just passed it a year and a half ago. So now all five states or four states around us um, will sell them to Minnesotans and especially Wisconsin their laws specifically written to sell to Minnesotans it's much more difficult for a Wisconsin resident to buy there than it is for a Minnesotan and um, so this does allow Minnesotans to travel less distances to get them but I do believe there are other people that uh, would like to use them they're just afraid to to go out and do it because it is against the law Right. So how, let's talk about just the taxes on this. How much would the state bring in if we were to have the same legalized fireworks that all of our neighbors do? Yeah, you know, it's been a few years since they've done a fiscal analysis, but I remember back uh, when Representative Creasel brought the bill, the estimate then was four to five million dollars in sales taxes alone. And I believe um, the reports that I've seen is we've actually grown, more people are using them. Um, and then there's also the issue of allowing Minnesota companies to sell them here, that's more revenue as well. So I believe it would be in excess of $5 million a year. So a new revenue stream. Uh, I noticed that your bill does have bipartisan support. Senator David Tomasoni signed on to it, but the bill did not get a hearing this session. Do you know why? Um, one of the biggest reasons was because uh, the special election that I was in in January, um, I was not into the Senate until into February and then kind of getting acquainted with the way things uh, operate in the Senate compared to the House. And so by the time I got the bill submitted and asked for the hearing, the Judiciary Committee was pretty much booked up. Um, they had over 500 bills already um, requesting hearings. So um, I've been working with uh, Senator Limmer and hopefully we will get our hearing next year. He's pretty willing and open if we can fit in the schedule. Now, Governor Dayton vetoed a similar bill back in 2016, citing safety concerns. So what do you have to say to people who are worried about the safety, especially of children, if you can have these explosive aerial devices available? You know, especially when it comes to children, I've looked at the numbers, and 90% of injuries for children come from sparklers and the ground emitting, the type that are already legal in Minnesota. So the injuries, um, to children especially, are, the danger is already there. And when you drive around the state, people are already using them. The difference would be the fireworks companies would be committed to running the public service announcements, things that talk about safety, uh, things that aren't on the air in Minnesota right now. So it all comes down to personal responsibility, um, being learning how to use them correctly and, and following through on that. 
But if this did become law in Minnesota, there would be an educational component along with it to make sure that kids are kept far enough away and, and all of those things. Yeah, the fireworks companies have told me they would start running public service announcements. They run those ads in other states where the aerial and audible are legal, and that would happen in Minnesota as well. For at least the two weeks surrounding the 4th of July, I see bottle rockets and I hear the booms from my neighbors almost every night. To what degree is the law that's banning these being enforced, to your knowledge? For the most part, it's not being enforced at all. Um, a couple years ago, the city of Minneapolis uh, came out and in a public announcement said, please don't report, we're not going to respond. And you know, in, a, in extreme cases, I believe they will respond, um, but for the most part, that's just not something that they have the time and the resources to respond to. So as long as people are being responsible and not to, uh, you know, uh, one of the changes I'm making to my bill is putting an hour uh, hours of use on because you know what nobody wants to suddenly be awakened at one or two in the morning by somebody using fireworks and I understand that. So from your point of view this is uh, this is basically just having the law catch up with common practice. Correct. Uh, I don't know if you're aware but last year the city of St. Paul canceled its 4th of July fireworks display and I would guess that some people would maybe like to just have their own family events with bottle rockets and these aerial things, especially for cities and towns that maybe are struggling with budgetary issues and are potentially canceling their own fireworks display. Are you hearing about that from just a regional or local standpoint, you know, people, cities, towns choosing not to have fireworks? You know, a, a lot of it has come from the the insurance costs, uh, things like that, the, the liability is what's driving a lot of these towns away from doing the public displays. And so I think that's where some of the individuals and families are looking to supplement that. And, you know, I look at some of my areas around the lakes, um, it almost becomes a competition. And I've heard a lot of people say, you know, they'll get out in the boat or on their pontoon and on one of the two lakes around Pine City and the displays that have gone on by the private um, cabin owners uh, is more impressive than some of the small town displays just because it's, like I said, almost become a competition between people on the lake who has the better um, deal. Uh, and so people really enjoy that and it's something that can be done instead of a community maybe having to put forward the money to do that. Uh, is there a regional breakdown on this issue? I mean, you're talking about your region, and I spent one Fourth of July at Lahamadu, and we were on the on the dock, and there were like seven different fireworks displays mm -hmm. going on simultaneously, which was really great. But is there more support maybe in Greater Minnesota than in the urban areas? What are your urban lawmakers? What do they have to say about this? You know, it does fit more in the rural areas. Um, the de population density isn't there, you know, so it's not disturbing as many people. Um, one of, but that's one of the reasons I want to legalize it as well, so that people are willing to talk to their neighbors and let them know it's coming. Um, but there are so many urban uh, legislators who are concerned. Um, but the bill was drafted to take that into account. Um, any city or township can pass an ordinance to ban the use of the fireworks within their jurisdiction. Because we understand it's not meant for every area. But we need to pass the law for the whole state so that areas that do believe it's good for their area can use them. Senator Rarick, thank you so much. Thank you. Lawmakers and advocates made the case for a resolution that would hold pharmaceutical companies liable for adverse side effects resulting from vaccines. In 1986, there were seven vaccines that were routinely administered to the American children. Yet there were so many catastrophic injuries caused by this schedule that some of the vaccine manufacturers threatened to stop producing them due to this large damage awards that they were ordered to pay when people were injured. Uh, so pharmaceutical industry heavily lobbied Congress to pass the National uh, Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, or the NCVIA, in 1986. This unprecedented law established a compensation program administered by the government and funded by a tax on vaccine consumers themselves. This was to compensate those who were killed or harmed by vaccines. Now, there were some valuable requirements that were set up by this law, including the requirement that doctors report any adverse vaccine reactions to the new vaccine, ad to this new uh, system that was set up called the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, and that doctors uh, provide parents with the vaccine risk and benefit information before their children are vaccinated. This law also 
uh, allowed the petitioners who did not receive a judgment within 240 day window uh, that were not satisfied with the judgment by the, NC, uh, the NVCIP that they could then withdraw from this program and sue the vaccine manufacturers in civil court. The option of suing in civil court was removed in 2011 with the Supreme Court decision in uh, Busiewicz versus Wyeth. Now vaccine victims have no recourse but to petition the government for damages when harm occurs. Overturning this decision and returning the, in returning the NCBIA to its original intent is what our, res, is what our resolution is about. This, this is an important check and balance that we have set up to ensure that vaccines will be safer. I'm here to lend my support to the concern that, that people have about giving any uh, manufacturer liability protection from anything. Maybe it made sense back in the day when we had to have people provide vaccines and and I'm not here as an anti-vaxxer, I'm not a pro-vaxxer, I think that it makes sense for some people like any other medication that people should be informed and have the chance to know the, the good things and the bad things and then select based upon what their family uh, chooses. And I think people generally agree uh, about that. But in this situation, we're talking merely about the liability side. It's amazing the amount of claims there have been, and you'll hear about that, uh, and how torturous the route is to actually get a claim to be um, resolved and actually be paid out and still there's multiple hundreds of millions of dollars and more than a billion I think in, in claims. Because the manufacturers can't be sued, there's no motivation for them to test for safety. Why would they test their vaccination for safety and possibly have bad results or even good results? Why would they even do it if they can't be sued? There's no reason for them to do it. And they don't ensure the safety of these products and even worse, I rarely see the CDC or the manufacturers telling us if you get the flu shot, your chances of 1% or 0.1% of this happening to you, of you being paralyzed. No one's telling us that. They're just saying, take the shots, take the vaccines. No one is telling us what is, is the, uh, the, the downside. And I think we all deserve that right to at least decide, hey, do I wanna take this vaccination or not? Because, because sometimes the consequence is paralysis. And I have many clients who are paralyzed and some of them died. So the question remains, and this is what the resolutions are asking Congress to do, is to override the Supreme Court decision and, uh, and uh, remove Bruzewitz to allow petitioners to file suits in state or federal court. So the question remains, can a federal law shield of vaccine manufacturers from certain product liability lawsuits in civil court, state or federal, that seek damages for serious health problems suffered by our children because of defective designed products. That question still remains and that's what we're asking in these resolutions. Senator Ken Eakin proposed a bill for a constitutional amendment that would create a dedicated revenue stream for caring for seniors and people with disabilities. He joins me now to talk more about it. Welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Lawmakers on both sides of the aisle are talking about the unsustainability of funding for long-term care and health and human services spending. You're proposing a constitutional amendment that would direct money specifically for long-term care for elderly and disabled people. Why the constitutional amendment approach? Well, we are facing demographic changes the likes of which we've never seen in world history. And it's going to create some major challenges that uh, we need to address. And I, I think it's an issue that's big enough and important enough that it uh, deserves to be on the ballot and to engage the general population in this discussion because of how important this issue is. How are we going to care for this aging population and for the increase in people with disabilities uh, who need long-term care services. Uh, so that's the reason behind it. Uh, I do think that uh, a constitutional amendment will shine the spotlight on the problem, uh, a problem that's too often neglected. I often tell the story about, I started flying a little airplane about 15 years ago. Uh, I don't have my own, but I belong to a club and they would let me fly it down to St. Paul uh, for session and a more experienced pilot was talking to me about the dangers of flying at night because I flew, fly, fly at night quite often and it's beautiful at night with the lights and everything I as imagine. you're coming into the cities but it's also more dangerous if your engine quits because it's hard to see where to put the airplane down and this more experienced pilot told me what you do is you glide the airplane down to an area that you think looks good 
And when you're about 100 feet off the ground, you turn on the landing lights so you can see what's in front of you. So he said, you turn on the landing lights, and if you don't like what you see, turn them off again. And that was the end of his <laughs> advice. Obviously, it was a joke. Uh, but I tell that story because a lot of people govern like that. And right now, a lot of people are turning off the landing lights on this issue. And if we don't shine the spotlight on the issue, we're going to land in a bad spot. And so that's one of the reasons I think we need to shine the spotlight on the issue. And uh, we do have constitutionally dedicated funding for a number of other things, including parks and trails, roads and bridges, uh, public broadcasting, history centers, the arts, all of these things. But we have nothing for our most vulnerable citizens. And if anybody needs constitutionally protected and dedicated funding more, it's the most vulnerable citizens in our, in our population. Well, then let's talk about how you're going to pay for it, because uh, according to the amendment, it will be funded by closing a tax loophole. What is this loophole? Right. Uh, well, the Social Security tax, which is a tax, a federal tax, uh, on income for supporting Social Security, only applies right now to the first $128,000 of income. Uh, it's indexed, so every year it goes up a little bit uh, because of inflation. Uh, but anything you make after $128,000, you don't pay any tax on for Social Security. And this is in Minnesota specifically? No, this is across the whole country. Across the whole state, okay. It is across the whole country. But I figured that if the federal government uh, is going to stop that tax at 128000 we can pick up where they leave off and continue taxing income above 128000 at the same rate that the feds tax below 128000 So making it, in effect, a, a flat tax. Taxing every dollar the same, taxing everyone the same. Everybody would pay the same percent of their income in taxes. And it's only on wages and salaries. It's not on you know, investment income. It's not on businesses. It's just on uh, wages and, and salaries, just as the Social Security tax is now. And it would float with the, the federal Social Security tax. It would generate a significant amount of revenue. Uh, I've referred to this as the biggest tax loophole in history uh, because of the major benefits those who, who get it uh, receive. Uh, it would only affect, affect the top 4.5% of the population. Uh, so 95.5% of the people in the state would see no impact from this whatsoever. Uh, and, uh, and it would generate the revenue necessary to meet the challenges of the future. The, everybody agrees on that. As a matter well, of fact, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, opponents are going to say, though, this is a tax increase that mm. those people in Minnesota who do make above this threshold will take their money, their careers, their lives to another state that doesn't tax them, that it will be bad for business. How, how do you counter that? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm sensitive to concerns about people leaving. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, we need to take that into consideration. But the fact is, we're not asking them to pay any more than regular income people are. They're paying exactly the same percent of income as everyone else is below that makes under $128,000 a year in income per individual. So uh, we're not asking any more. And I've talked to a lot of people who fall into that income bracket who are more than willing to contribute and to pay their fair share in ensuring that our most vulnerable citizens are provided with the care that they need. Uh, they are, are, are good people. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and they want to do their part. So I, I think that a lot of people live in Minnesota not just to you know find a place to uh, uh, not pay taxes. They're looking for a place that has a high quality of life. And a part of that quality of life is making sure that no one is left behind. And, uh, and everybody, I, I think in Minnesota, the people that live in Minnesota live here because of our quality of life and because we are a state that, that uh, has compassion and uh, that provides for the most vulnerable. Because almost everybody has somebody in their life who are vulnerable whether it be a grandparent or whether it be somebody with intellectual disabilities. As I had in my family, I had a brother who uh, was intellectually disabled. I, I had a father who lived six years in a nursing home. I think almost everybody has stories like that to tell, and everybody, I think, wants to contribute to providing them with the care that they need. Now, the legislature tends to be a reactive body, and this your bill is proposing to look at something that hasn't quite yet happened yet, other than assisted living facilities popping up on every corner. This tsunami has not crested. It is still a disaster potentially looming in the future in terms of how we're going to care for these people. Is it too early to try to do something? No. As a matter of fact, I think we've waited a little too long. Uh, I think that we need to, to act quickly because 
we're already experiencing some of the problems uh, because of the increasing demands in, in long-term care services. We do see a high turnover rate among those who are providing care because of <clears throat> the lower pay. Uh, we need to make sure that we're compensating these people adequately so that we get good quality people into the profession who are going to stay for the long term and who are going to provide that, that critical quality of care. Uh, so I don't think that uh, this is too early. I think that, uh, that uh, we need to act and act now. The longer we wait, the harder it becomes to solve the problem. So we need to start preparing now. And, and the constitutional amendment I've, I've, <clears throat> I've proposed uh, uh, does go for 25 years, so it would get us through that period uh, where the baby boom generation is going to need those services. Finally, uh, you initially introduced this in 2016, so this is not the first go-round for this idea. <laughs> Has it gained any traction since then? It, <clears throat> it's gaining traction among uh, many of the people out in the country, uh, out around the state that I've talked to. I've talked to all the uh, various long-term care associations and groups that represent those with disabilities and, 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 and seniors and long-term care for, for those individuals. And it gets a very warm reception. Uh, I think there's a, a growing interest in, in something of this nature. Um, and uh, I've, I've run into issues with people in the legislature who say, for instance, they don't want to budget through the Constitution. Well, as I've already mentioned, that, that train has already left the station. Uh, that ship's already sailed. We already have constitutionally dedicated funding for all of these other things. Uh, and, uh, and, and as far as the, the funding source, uh, you mentioned some of the objections some may have to the funding source that I proposed. I'm not stuck on that particular funding source. Uh, I do think we need to start the discussion now. And nobody wants to discuss this. Again, people seem to be putting their ha heads in the sand when it comes to this issue. So I'm trying to start the discussion. And for those who object or who reject the, the proposal I've made, um, my question to them is, well, what's your alternative? Because no is not a solution. So we need to, to, uh, uh, we need to start the discussion. And that's what this amendment is designed to do. Senator Eakin, I want to thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Shannon. Appreciate it. In our occasional series, The People's House, historian Brian Pease talks about one of the unique features of the state capitol. The state capitol Rathskeller is sort of a time capsule from 1905 when the building was built. What is the history of this impressive basement room? Yeah, this is a really significant part of Cass Gilbert's envision or visioning of these spaces. And it's uh, unique because it's a German Rathskeller, so it's patterned after something you would find in a German public hall. The tradition is they debate upstairs and then at the end of the day they come down and have a few drinks, talk to each other, so there's a camaraderie and a fellowship. So it's kind of a day, a place to unwind after a busy day. So there's that, you know, the German immigration, that was our largest immigration group, has been throughout our history of a state. And so that is a nice nod to the German heritage, but also to Im kind of impart that uh, tradition of a German public space and a place to gather uh, below ground. The combination of anti-German sentiment and prohibition had a big effect on the Rathskeller. What happened? That really was a, a key event in how you would have seen this building and this space in particular after the World War I began. So it was kind of a double whammy, a, a two-edged sword for the Rathskeller because it has a lot of uh, drinking slogans written in German. So now we're fighting a war against Germany. Plus there was a lot of strong prohibition forces. So you have German drinking slogans, which is not a good combination for what people saw as a, a place to bring the public down to or be a part of that uh, establishment. So this entire ceiling, all the walls were whitewashed. Everything was painted white. And that was the tradition for uh, many, many years. There was a time in the 30s when Governor Theodore Christensen painted some of the slogans back in. And then we're not sure why that got covered up again a few years after that. And it wasn't until we did the restoration of the space in 1999 that we brought back all the original stencils, all the drinking slogans again, to give you a sense of what it would have appeared like in 1905. How extensive was the research that needed to be done to bring it back to its original intent? Yeah, we, we did a lot of research just to 
uh, understand the space a lot more. Um, that's where we never really found any evidence to say that this was you know, a governor's edict because of the war, World War I. Most of the uh, documentation we see with letters to the governor, women's auxiliary groups, was to, to kind of advocate for the prohibition, to remove the drinking slogans. But it, it's a combination of both. I think we can uh, understand that's kind of the sentiment of America at that time. Why should visitors to the Capitol come see the Rathskeller? Well, as I said before, it's a really neat space. It's uh, something you don't necessarily expect to see in the state capitol. And uh, once again, since it's been restored, 1999, it opened, reopened in 2000. It's a full service, you know, cafeteria again, so you can during eat here. During the legislative during, session. During the legislative session, you can come down here and eat. And then it's also just a, a beautiful place to see that decoration. And uh, it's. It's a combination of an American rascal and a German rascaler because you have traditionally in a rascal in Germany you might have German eagles. Well here we have eagles that are American eagles instead of a German eagle. And then you also have two dates that are important parts of our state's history, 1849, which is the year we became a territory, 1858 we became the 32nd state. So those uh, dates were part of that original stencil. And so, there's insets as you as you walk through and see this restored space we were able to preserve some of the original stencil and so that's inset against the wall and there's a new layer of plaster on, on on the edges of that or above that that has a new stencil but throughout the space you can see these really neat uh, examples of what it looked like in 1905. The public is welcome to come down here we have a nice little exhibit that Minnesota Historical Society put together a little display to explain a little bit more of the history and you can see you know, some of what happened to this space. And, and you also discover there are 22 layers of paint on top of the original art. So there was a lot of overpainting and painting of the ceiling over time. And since the renovation in 2017, there is uh, overflow space now by the governor's dining room and the judicial dining room. Is that, is that right? Yeah, there, there's additional eating space, and, and that's really a nice addition to the public as, access and usability of this space. Uh, this is a, can be a noisy space when there's a lot of people here. It's a neat historic space to have lunch, but also if you want a little bit more quieter conversation or overflow, there's a, a kind of an adjunct space down the hallway that's another neat space with reproductions of the furniture that was there, the tables and the chairs, some television, so if you want to watch the committees or the session, you can kind of keep up to date with that. So as part of the restoration project, it's a really important part of what we do here and how the public can use the spaces. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thank you for joining us.